The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we're closing out 2020 on one of the most important stories of the year. We're going to definitely talk about this more in our year in review show, but certainly debt is... There's no way to take it out of the top three stories. It, in fact, is, if not the most important story of 2020. And debt is very interesting when we talk about China's overseas lending. And there's been a lot of news this week in particular about Chinese overseas lending and what's going to happen in response to the COVID-19 crisis, what's been happening over the past, say, few years, and it's all kind of coming together. Let me just bring everybody up to date first before we go into the topic in more detail. The DSSI, now that's the G20's Debt Service Suspension Initiative, has been a key part of 2020's debt story. And China so far this year is actually the biggest contributor to the DSSI, uh, suspending somewhere between $1.9 and $2.1 billion in repayments that have been due. Now, that's according to the G20. It's interesting because there's been a lot of criticism of the Chinese coming from people like, say, David Malpass, who's the president of the World Bank, and others that say that the Chinese are not doing enough to participate and engage the, in the DSSI. But it turns out that they're actually doing more uh, than any other country. So a lot of confusion that's there. That number is likely to increase substantially in 2021 as more deferrals are going to be requested by borrowing countries around the world. In all, we're looking at somewhere around $28 billion of Chinese loans that are now in renegotiation or have been at some time this year. Now, those are calculations that are done by the New York-based research firm Rhodium Group. Rhodium also says that as of October of this year, 18 renegotiations were underway, and another 12 were ongoing at the time that they published that research report. So very interesting that there's a lot going on. We don't actually see it because it happens behind the scenes. This is very much a part of the Chinese lending process, this opacity. It's really one of the frustrating things from those of us looking on the outside in, but there is a lot going on. Now, the highlight of this week, the big story that came out this week, was a new interactive database from Boston University's Center for Global Development. It's the China Overseas Development Finance Database, which is a geospatial data set that analyzes China's sovereign lending commitments and their proximity, and this is what's interesting, Kobus, to critical habitats, national protected areas, and indigenous people's lands. So connecting debt with sustainability is very, very interesting. Some of the key findings of the report were China's overseas development finance is almost as large as that of the World Bank, uh, though more intermittent in nature. So from 2008 to 2019 or so, uh, Chinese overseas development finance amounted to nearly half a trillion dollars, about $462 billion. And just to put that into perspective, the World Bank during that same period uh, extended about $467 billion of loans, so really just a $5 billion difference. It just gives you the size of how much China's been putting out into the world. Uh, but it's not spread evenly. Just as in Africa, so much of China's financial engagement is not evenly spread across 54 countries. It's the same around the world. So, for example, 60% of the total is just consumed by 10 countries. The largest borrower in the world is Venezuela, who makes up 10% of China's total overseas lending. So it shows you how it's not evenly weighted and evenly spread. Now, the big headline that came out of this report was published in the Financial Times. It was a topic that we covered in our newsletter. There was a little bit of controversy about this. We're going to get to that later. But said that the Chinese overseas development financing from the country's two major policy banks, that would be the China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank, or China Exim Bank, pledged from $75 billion in 2016, and it just fell like a rock to $4 billion in 2019. That's last year. So a huge drop. Kobus, there's a lot going on. We don't know 
everything about it. The way that these calculations are, that they come about, researchers come about these calculations, sometimes is confusing. The methodologies are always something of interest. You're an academic, you study these kinds of things. But it is, it is a turbulent year when it comes to Chinese over, overseas finance. COVID um, and the, the, the resulting debt crisis has thrown all of this into high relief. But I think one of the things that we're now realizing is that this, this actually shows the, the current debt crisis is, reveals a, a kind of a crisis in development financing, you know, like writ large. Like it's, it's a, we're in a, a kind of, I think, an inflection point where a lot of decisions has to be, have to be made about how we're going to be financing development into the future, not only for economic development for countries, but also to, to deal with, with issues like climate change. Um, because obviously a lot of development decisions then bake in certain kind of climate implications as well. So I think we're, we're in a moment where where the, the the world has to have a conversation about how developing countries are going to be funding their infrastructure into the future. And of course, China is going to be a massive participant in that conversation. Well, we wanted to bring some perspective on all of this and to kind of dive deeper in some of the numbers, but more importantly, also to look at some of the trends, both from the Chinese perspective, but also from the researching point of view, which is, again, looking at some of these, uh, these these figures out of Boston University. So we are thrilled to have on the program for the first time Dr. Yan Wang, who's a non-resident senior research fellow with the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University, the same outfit that put together that new database. Uh, she's also a senior visiting fellow at the Institute of New Structural Economics at Peking University. That's Justin Yifu Lin's think tank there at Beida. And so Dr. Dr. Wang is a well-known scholar in the in, in this space, and so we're thrilled after many years of following her work very closely to have her on the show. A very good morning to you from Washington, D.C. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's my pleasure to join you. Yes, it's wonderful to have you on. You and Kevin Gallagher, who's a professor at Boston University in the, uh, the Global Development Policy Center, co-authored a paper, Sovereign Debt Through the Lens of Asset Management Implications for uh, SADC countries. SADC countries, of course, are Southern Africa development community countries. So you have just been thinking a lot about this issue of overseas lending, finance. And what I think is going to be so interesting to hear from you is that you're looking at this topic from both the research side in, say, the U.S. and looking at all the English language scholarship, you're also seeing it from the Chinese side as well. So I think before we get into the details of your findings in the paper and what other research is coming out of Boston University, why don't you help us understand where we are right now at this moment, at the end of 2020, in the overseas development finance space with regards to what the Chinese are doing? Give us a, a big overview of what's going on. Uh, it is indeed a big question. So how do we frame the policy framework and, and get some insight? Uh, usually I look at the top leaders' domestic policy need. So overseas development finance is dependent on the domestic economic needs. Uh, for example, in 1999, uh, China designed a Go West strategy. And uh, in the same way, in 2000, uh, China held this uh, uh, FOCAC meeting, China-Africa Development Forum. It was uh, motivated by domestic economic needs of uh, see seeking larger markets as well as develop its uh, comparative advantage, utilizing its comparative advantage uh, to help others. You said it's, it's rooted in the domestic economics of the country, and that's probably true worldwide. But the idea here is that China was in the going out period in the early 2000s and late 90s, uh, wanted to go out. But now China's in a very different space, and the economy is not as strong as it was back then. There's the dual circulation agenda that came out through the new five-year plan. Talk to us a little bit about the moment that we're in right now as it relates to where China's economy is domestically and that how that relates and impacts the overseas financing. Yes, China is facing unprecedented change in 100 years. So we call it by Nian Bian Ju. So the international environment has completely changed with the trade war, uh, technology war, and the disconnect. Uh, so China, uh, Chinese leaders is uh, 
rethinking of everything. Development strategy is changed to dual circulation, with the development finance is only one small part in that dual circulation, which is domestic circulation and international circulation. So the importance of overseas development finance has reduced. And the Chinese leader is in the mood of risk management is is that um is that also then a reason w- uh, for for the finding that that recently came out of Boston University that that Chinese external lending has has, has fallen so so rapidly um can can you kind of you know kind of lay out a little bit kind of you know kind of what do you think some of the some of the underlying factors are in you know in that kind of rapid change in in lending patterns if you look at that, back at uh, 2016 there was a big accumulation of chinese uh, foreign exchange reserves uh, at that time it was very high so enterprises and Chinese leaders were very confident in investing abroad. However, in 2017, uh, the foreign exchange reserve uh, has reduced and uh, there was a big criticism of China being uh, highly leveraged. So at that time, there was control of leveraging. Reduced leverage is uh, uh, implemented, so there has been a decline in China's overseas uh, lending. In 2018, the World Bank did a study on uh, Belt and Road Initiative, warning about uh, debt sustainability issues. So Chinese leaders, uh, I think, continues to reduce leverage domestically and reduce exposure to uh, default risks abroad. Uh, So the lending continues to decline. Actually, uh, CDB, China Development Bank, has faced uh, with audits, uh, a lot of audits and inspection panels and regulation. So the lending has reduced uh, since 2017. You brought up this issue of risk management, and that's a theme that we've heard a lot when we're talking about the two big policy banks, the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, that, say, five, ten years ago, they weren't doing due diligence as rigorously, the, the feasibility studies weren't as strong, they were lending money out pretty quickly, and that's now coming back to bite them. We're talking now about risk management. Can you be a little more specific as to what you're hearing from within the policy banks as to what that means is it be, is are they going to still continue to lend, but just there's going to be more discriminating, or are they cutting back altogether to reduce their risk? What does risk management mean in this context? Risk management covers both domestically and the international areas. So uh, domestically, as you can see, recently there was a lot of uh, effort to strengthen regulation, financial regulations. Uh, one famous event is the ANT, uh, the IPO cancelled. So the regulatory agencies, uh, they are enforcing the regulations more vigorously uh, by sending out inspection panels, uh, groups to large, large uh, banks as well as uh, financial groups such as uh, ANT, uh, Alibaba. So... Um, the, these uh, uh, large banks uh, originally were not uh, regulated uh, vigorously. Now they are facing a lot of uh, audits and uh, panels uh, for inspection. So the whole practice of development financing is being uh, re resought and also revamped. So I think... Uh, Chinese leaders, as as well as the management of the large banks, they need to learn some lessons from uh, these uh, potential default risks and also debt crisis. In in your paper, um, you raise the example of Angola as as uh, as a kind of a an example of what you call. Um, 
uh, kind of proof that, that China is a, a patient holder of credit. Or, so can, can you unpack that a little bit? Like what, what, what can we learn from, from the experience of, of the Angolan debt restructuring? And, and what do you mean when you say um, China is patient in that, in that regard? China's uh, state sector is a holder of uh, patient capital. This is based on my research with Justin Lin, patient capital. And there was a study uh, that is uh, too hard to summarize. Basically, the East Asian countries following the Confucian tradition, they save uh, quite a lot and and uh, save uh, in the form of banking uh, and banks and uh, uh, investment uh, in the real estate. So they are used to invest in uh, long-term uh, opportunities such as real estate, such as parents uh, investing in their children's uh, education, uh, such as uh, infrastructure projects. So there is this uh, comparative advantage of uh, utilizing patient capital. And this is also evident in China's practice with restructuring debt with a lot of uh, African countries. So there was debt reliefs for African countries uh, during many, many years back. So in the 1990s, in in the two FOCAC meetings uh, in 2007, but after 2008, debt write-offs uh, have been uh, reduced, but uh, more in the form of reprofiling or uh, extension of uh, repayment, that uh, refinancing is more popular. So this uh, restructuring in Angola is taking the form of reprofiling and uh, extension of uh, debt repayment. So this is what's confusing to me as somebody who follows this quite closely. And and again, I don't see anywhere near as much into this process as you do. So I'm hoping you can help help me understand this. On the one hand, you and the Rhodium Group talk about how the Chinese are reprofiling, restructuring, renegotiating, whatever you want to call it, all of these debts in Africa. And I do believe that's happening in part because we don't see the anxiety coming out of African presidents and prime ministerial offices. You don't hear panic coming out of Uru Kenyatta's you know, office at the State House in Nairobi, uh, presumably because there are talks going on right now, same in Zambia, same in Angola. But at the same time, we also hear that the Chinese have are very rigid on some principles, so they will not cancel outright lots of debts. They canceled some of their zero-interest loans and their grants, which amounted to a tiny percentage, less than 2%. So take that off the table as anything meaningful. Then in Zambia, we got a peak that they wanted, they insisted on $200 million of arrears payments be paid first before any debt settlements could go forward. So there we start to see the rigidity come in the system that they don't want to. Now, again, there are a lot of players here, not just the policy banks, but sometimes the state-owned enterprises. they are non-policy banks like the Industrial Commercial Bank of China, ICBC. So lots of different actors here. But it doesn't sound like there's a consistency in terms of how they're approaching their restructuring and that it is more varied than it seems on the surface. That's how it seems to me. Can you enlighten me on this, whether or not this restructuring is as seamless as you maybe suggested is? The Chinese leaders, uh, they prefer a tailored approach in debt stressed countries, distressed countries. So there is a hard budget constraints uh, for a lot of uh, commercial banks and uh, even in CDB. They raise the capital through international market and domestic market through bonds. And then they have to use, uh, you know, in a profitable ways uh, in order to pay their uh, interest. So there is a hard budget constraint. And China has also budget law, so they have to follow the budget law. So that's the reason for the rigidity. Actually, China does not have a foreign aid law. Therefore, Justin Lee and myself, we have advocated that China to uh, expedite 
the draft and the passing of uh, enactment of uh, foreign aid law. That's uh, a priority. If the foreign aid law can provide a clear definition approaches, as well as uh, the importance of debt sustainability of uh, overseas uh, investment, then and there will be a better framework to think about uh, debt restructuring. Right now, there is no framework, no no uh, framework for restructuring those debt. And also, the leader's preference is is also based on the Chinese experience of solving their own triangular debt. Uh, so this is all very tailored approach, and uh, sometimes it's an innovative approach. And China does not prefer a blanket uh, approach to solve this debt issue. And uh, sometimes uh, the blanket approach could cause uh, more hazard problems. Um, So, for example, if you uh, forgive some of the debt, you will not bring any liquidity to the developing countries. So developing countries need a lot of liquidity to import, uh, uh, say, uh, vaccines, uh, PPEs. They need a lot of uh, liquidity. So that forgiveness will not solve the liquidity problem. So we approach, we support the IMF to provide more liquidity. Uh, We support MDBs to provide more liquidity. Connecting on to that point, um, in, in the paper you also you also call for um, the issuing of, of IMF special drawing rights, but particularly for this reason to increase uh, liquidity. How you know kind of what what, what is the, the the view from from China about the in, in terms of the the role of the the IMF up to now in, in in the debt negotiation process and how it will go forward. I mean the the so far the. The issuance of special drawing rights has been has been um, opposed by the Trump administration. Um, do you foresee a Biden administration changing its mind on that issue? And like, and, and how does how does China generally see the the role of of the IMF and the World Bank in 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 relation to the debt uh, crisis? Yeah, Chinese leaders as well as our uh, intellectuals, uh, scholars, uh, we support uh, multilateralism. And we support more important roles uh, played by the IMF. And uh, issuing uh, SDRs uh, is a very good way of uh, providing liquidity to developing countries. Right now, uh, all the central banks uh, of uh, advanced countries, they can basically use uh, quantitative easing. However, developing countries... uh, cannot use quantitative easing. This is uh, really unfair. So there is no, uh, there is no valid reason uh, for the IMF, for the uh, U.S. against the IMF uh, uh, providing more SDRs. In the new Biden administration, we have been hoping that uh, more flexibility for issuing SDR. So just to bring everybody up to speed, for those of you who are not familiar with the controversy over the SDRs, the SDRs is a mechanism that the world, that the IMF has, where it increases the capital of uh, of each shareholder. And what it, but what it does is it it affords everybody to get money at the same time, and that's the core problem that the U.S. has with this: is they don't believe that uh, the money should go necessarily to Iran or China. And, and it's objecting there. So it was part of that. China was very much part of the objection to issuing new special drawing rights. So maybe in a Biden administration where the rhetoric between the United States and China is dialed down a little bit, that may be something that happens. The SDR issue has also been a major call from African leaders because they, again, as Yen pointed out, are facing a liquidity crisis. And by issuing new special drawing rights, it would actually resolve some of those liquidity challenges there. 
there. So just wanted to kind of provide a little bit of background in case people weren't familiar with the SDR controversy, something that will come up again in 2021 as well. In your paper, and this has been an issue that came up a lot in 2020, you address the issue of the debt trap. This is the allegation from lar- largely coming out of the United States that the that China intentionally goes out to overwhelm countries with debt in with the idea of seizing an asset in exchange. In your paper, you point out that there is no evidence of any asset seizures anywhere in the world. This echoes findings by lots of different scholars, including Rhodium Group, as well as uh, Professor Deborah Braudigam at the Johns Hopkins University China Africa Research Initiative. We've debunked that theory for a very, very long time. Uh, but nonetheless, it persists. And you talk about something called asset-based refinance. And, and it's an adjunct to the debt trap because it involves assets. So can you explain to us what you mean by asset-based refinance and why that might be part of the solution to resolving the debt crisis in places like Africa? So indeed, there is no evidence for asset seizure or the debt trap diplomacy. Chinese financiers, uh, they are used to finance large uh, infrastructure projects. China's development financing uh, is driven mostly by client countries' demand. So there is maybe some uh, overborrowing from uh, partner countries, host countries. But the intention is to help uh, African countries uh, to uh, solve their bottlenecks in infrastructure. There is no intention to seize assets. Regarding the new approach on asset-based refinance, my motivation is that African countries need a lot of cash liquidity. So there are a lot of uh, completed projects Uh, If the African countries have already repaid part of the completed projects and uh, they have equity in those already completed projects. So Justin Lin and myself, we studied 214 completed projects and some of them have been uh, paid off. Some of them uh, have been uh, partially paid off. So African countries, host countries, they have equity in those completed projects. They can utilize the equity, say, to require multilateral development banks for refinancing. And just like uh, the example I gave in the, uh, in the paper. So in the future, some of this uh, equity can be, say, open for public bidding for a sovereign wealth fund to invest in those equity. Uh, this is a good way of providing liquidity. Let's wrap up our discussion with a look to next year in 2021. Uh, your research with Boston University and Kevin Gallagher's research with the new overseas loan database indicates that there is a sharp drop in Chinese overseas financing. How much is subject to debate and discussion, but it has been going down doesn't look like it's going to pick up anytime soon. I think the point that you made that you have to look at Chinese domestic economics to understand the overseas lending patterns is very, very astute. So with that in mind, looking at the Chinese economy where it is today, looking at the fact that Chinese lending has been on the decline for for quite a few years now, what are we looking at in terms of 2021? What should people expect? In 2021, uh, right now, China is the only engine of growth uh, globally. So uh, China is having a positive growth rate this year. In 2021, we expect uh, China's import and export will increase dramatically, but the overseas lending uh, may be going down. As I said, uh, Chinese leaders uh, want to uh, reduce risks and uh, risk uh, of default. So risk management is very much on their mind. I suspect the Chinese leaders and the banks will be more selective in providing development financing uh, to countries along the Belt Road Initiative. I think um, they will behave more strategically uh, in selecting the projects that they will finance. 
Dr. Yen Wong is a non-resident senior research fellow with the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University and a senior visiting fellow at the Institute of New Structural Economics at Beijing University. Uh, she is also the co-author of a paper with Kevin Gallagher at Boston University, uh, Sovereign Debt Through the Lens of Asset Management Implications for SADC Countries. I highly recommend you add this to your reading list to better understand what's going on right now in the massive, massive changes that are underway in Chinese overseas development financing. Uh, there's a profound shift that's happening that we haven't seen at least in the past 10 to 15 years. So, Yen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. It's wonderful to finally hear you on our program. It's been, uh, we've been derelict in not having you on sooner, but we're so glad to have had the opportunity to get your insights. Thank you very much for having me. Well, there you have it, Kobus. I really, really hope that there are people in African capitals who are listening to what Yen Wang has to say. Because it is very, very sobering that the world in 2021 is not going to look like it did before 2021. She said it really clear. The, the, the lending is going down. The gravy train is done. The easy access to Chinese capital is over. The due diligence is going to be up. The feasibility studies are going to be up. The risk management is going to be tight. These guys are under enormous pressure in Beijing to crack down. And she brings up the most interesting point here. And this was something that I brought up in one of the columns that I wrote for the newsletter, I don't know, about three, four weeks ago, about how people have to do a better job in understanding what's going on in China. And the knowledge of Chinese domestic economics, the knowledge of Chinese history, politics, all of that is unfortunately very, very low in many parts of Africa. But if you don't understand what's going on in China today in terms of the domestic economic situation, you aren't going to understand why they're making decisions based on their lending patterns. So the overseas lending is going down because of domestic political and economic considerations. And she was very, very clear on that. And that is something that I think everybody has to do a better job of because it is, it is critical. But boy, things are changing and she, she laid it out for us. It was right there. So people cannot say they haven't been warned that it's going to be much more difficult to tap Chinese capital in the future. Part of part of what what's becoming clear to me is that is that this this crisis is really going to have to um, force a reckoning not only with with changes in Chinese financing, you know, which, which obviously, as 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 um, Dr. Wang pointed out, you know, has so much to do with with Chinese domestic preoccupations, but with the the whole issue of of development financing itself you know i think i think this 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 is kind of the, a crisis point point we 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 reaching now which shows that it's not a situation that that the system was running fine and then china distorted it or that these african countries were just lending too much it's it's a, it's a situation that the very system of 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 development financing itself is broken um and i think it's really inspiring to hear the the kind of new instruments um that that are being explored by you know kind of by researchers like dr wang because because you know the very issue of 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 development i think um and the need for Developing countries to move ahead quickly in order to not be stuck in, you know, kind of stuck behind the queue all the for the entire future, or to simply be whomped by climate change, um, is is so crucial at the moment um, that that we, we it needs a, a systemic rethink. I think. So there's not all bad news here. So for example, Ivory Coast and Morocco are going back out into the debt markets and they're getting a very warm reception. There's a lot of desire to buy some African debt, but it is some African debt. It is not all African debt. And that's going to be the key problem here. So countries like Zambia, I think are going to suffer enormously. Certain countries like Ivory Coast are going to do much better. So it's not going to be uniform as well. But Kobus, I'd like to get your take on this because I think the challenge is also going to be for the Chinese. And it brings me back to my college days. <laughs> I'll, I'll reveal a little bit of my uh, my personal history here, but there was, I went through a period where I, I in college where I enjoyed partying quite a bit, and I had a lot of booze in my dorm, and it was it was a lot of fun. And boy, the friends just came out of nowhere. I had so many friends when I was in that party phase for about six months, and then at one point I just woke up and I said, you know what, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted, and I stopped. And you know what happened? Nobody came by. <laughs> <laughs> the party was over. 
And I just wonder that for the past 15 years, Chinese diplomats have, you know, they've had a party. They've had a lot of cash. They've been throwing it around. Six billion for your railway in Kenya. Two billion for your railway in Nigeria. Yes, we can fund that hydroelectric dam. Sure, we can do that power station. More roads all over the place. Now, if they don't have that, it's going to be, they're going to have to use some other skills to do their diplomatic outreach, right? It's not as easy as it was when you're just kind of flipping money out. And I just wonder if, if they're going to be forced to be more transparent, if they're going to be forced to be more, to accommodate more to international standards, if they're going to be forced to play by rules that they're not accustomed to. This is not a government that is used to being forthright and open, but yet in a world where the IMF plays a bigger role in lending, maybe that will force the Chinese to be more transparent and to accommodate more to international lending standard, standards rather than the Chinese, simply because the Chinese won't have the leverage anymore that they once had because they were throwing around the big cash, which they're clearly not going to do anymore. What do you think about the impact on the Chinese side when this all kind of starts to change? Yeah, um, I, I can see I can see where you're coming from. Um, my my feeling is, um, and again, you know, this, you know, like I, I don't have any inside information here, but you know, this is just just my reading from the outside, is that um, that there's you know that, that there's probably gonna it's 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 a different version of kind of crossing the river while feeling the stones, right? It's this kind of dynamic, dynamic dynamic adaptation. You know, it's, it's, a, it's such a kind of strong part of Chinese international engagement, and and you know one big factor, is, you know, kind of in that dynamic driving that dynamic um, adaptation is domestic concerns. You know, for example, you know the need to, for Chinese companies to move outwards or the need to move um, for you know uh, foreign currency or like the the um, currency reserve outwards um so my you know my my, my feeling is that that I, I don't think we're going to see a shutdown but i think we're going to see the involvement of a new set of instruments and a new set of standards to, to to decide which kind of projects should be funded and then how they should be funded um and you know so so i think that is definitely going to change the game but i tend to resist the idea of you know kind of that it was simply kind of chinese profligacy you know kind of or just kind of you know like a wild and crazy lending left and right and also on the african side just kind of wild and crazy lending on the african side when the entire the entire kind of financial system is is essentially, or at the moment, that the kind of finance system is set up where crucial, you know, kind of non-negotiable, like forms of infrastructure, like green electricity, for example, is still thought of as some kind of luxury, not, you know, kind of a, a fundamental part of 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 how countries should move forward. So that I think is the, there is some kind of fundamental rethinking is needed in terms of of the the, the how the entire kind of fi financial rules. You know, and, and lending rules work. I'm not articulating this, you know, in any kind of sophisticated way, but there just seems to me that that you know, in, in order to in order for the world to to, yeah. to over the next ten years to move towards something more sustainable than what we have now, we're going to have to rethink, you know, kind of how countries finance things like green electricity, um, because if we don't, then we're doomed, right? Kind of like there's no way of of, of having of having our a kind of current set of norms. In, in, you know, kind of running as they as they have been up to now, and still be able to actually make that jump to actually decarbonize the world economy. I'm not sure that is going to happen, at least from the Chinese side, simply because CNN, for example, just ran a, a very interesting report last week about how the Chinese are funding a number of coal power plants throughout Africa, and there's quite a bit of yes. enthusiasm to continue funding coal throughout the Belt and Road. So while China may be greening at home, and while there's talk about greening the Belt and Road Initiative, maybe it, it feels a little bit of greenwashing to me, there's still a lot of investment going into coal. And coal is a popular energy source in Africa. There's a lot of coal on the continent, and there's a lot of desire to build coal plants like we saw in Zimbabwe and in other parts of the continent. But yes, but but and th that's very true. But it's also but that's again, it's not only true for China and Africa. You know, Australia, you know, a, a massive chunk Japan of its economy well. is dependent on coal. 
like and Canada is a massive hydrocarbon state. You know, um, so this is true. This is true for 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 kind of so-called developed economies as well. Um, and that that's what I mean is that that there's there's kind of like a new blue sky thinking is 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 needed in 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 a, you know in terms of a kind of a massive overhaul of a massive systemic overhaul because otherwise you know kind of this this you know otherwise the, there's just no way of, of, of making the kind of jump that we have to make. So, so I feel that in a way, Africa is kind of a canary in the coal mine. You know, kind of, um, huh, you know, um, you know, because because it's the the debt crisis is showing up in Africa now, but it it it's, it has it, it indicates a larger crisis, a larger crisis in how in how we think about infrastructure. Um, that I think is gonna is gonna take more kind of fundamental thinking than just simply whether individual countries have access to lending or not. Like you. I don't think that Chinese lending in Africa is going to go away. It's just going to become much smaller, more targeted, far more strategic, and much more disciplined than it was in the past. Now, if the lending volumes go down as low as Boston University says they are, um, that in many ways will have geopolitical con consequences and ramifications that extend beyond the Chinese in Africa, but also to the Europeans and the Americans. One of the real difficulties that Europeans and Americans, and to some extent the Japanese as well, had when coming into Africa was that they couldn't compete with the Chinese policy banks. But now if the Chinese policy banks are pulling back, it levels the playing field in some respects, doesn't it? I think so. I think it, it, it makes it easier for um, for all of these other emerging um, lenders to, to step in, not least because it then also... Um, you know, kind of forces African leaders to to be more creative in terms of who, like, wh where they look for finance. You know, so I think you know part of part of I think the 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 very the incredible generosity that has come out of China has been also a, a kind of a a kind of a bias towards China. You know, among African leaders now, I think African leaders will be forced to to work harder. I think in in order to 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 get these different kinds of finance, and hopefully that will also then force a reckoning in terms of which kind of projects we should be funding you know and i mean south africa is, is a key example of this south africa is is, is you know locking itself into into coal-fired electricity for the next th three to four decades um you know which is a which is a tragedy like a, not only a, a general tragedy but a specific health public health tragedy in south africa and it's, it's exactly that those kind of decisions that i think a kind of a, a, a kind of a shake up of, of the lending landscape will 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 f force like put more scrutiny on i think so it looks like 2021 in many ways is going to be a reset. It's Obviously, it's going to be a reset for the Chinese, as we heard from, from Yen. Uh, but we just even saw the Japanese foreign minister do a four-nation tour, and he talked about how he wants to be more engaged and there's more enthusiasm. Uh, certainly with the new Biden administration coming in, there's going to be a rethinking of U.S. policy towards Africa. And the Europeans have made noises for the past six months or so that they really want to re-engage Africa, again, on different terms than what they've done in the past. But it seems like if the Chinese are going to be changing their status, again, whatever that is, we don't know, it does offer an opportunity for a reset. And that is kind of exciting for all parties, because maybe what we've been doing up until now obviously has not necessarily led us into the best place right now, given the fact that a number of countries are facing some very acute financial problems. These are the issues that we are addressing every day. In fact, I mean, you get same day analysis on some of these really fast moving issues in our daily email newsletter. It goes out again, Monday to Friday. Uh, sign up at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Cobus and I are putting in quite a bit of time to it to make sure that we give you the full day's rundown of all the debt news, the politics, the geopolitics, tech. Let's see, uh, today was a big issue. We didn't talk about it. We're going to talk about it in a future podcast about new allegations of Chinese spying at the African Union. So anything that's really making news, we'll give you the first take on it in all of the day's news and the discussions that are going on. We've made it super affordable to get a subscription, $7 a month for students and teachers, $15 a month for everybody else. So once again, ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. If you have any questions at all, you can reach out directly to Cobus or myself. I'm at Eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com and Cobus, C-O-B-U-S, is at Cobus at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Super accessible. We love interacting with our listeners and our subscribers and just having discussions about China-Africa relations and politics and whatever's on your mind. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. We'll be back again next week uh, with the last few shows of 2020. Until then, thank you so much for listening.
The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>